My name's Beverly Thomas, even though it says Jennifer Goodman there. Um, this is her admin login, so we're sharing that name for now. But anyway, I'm the program director at the Preservation Alliance, for those who don't know me. I know some of you. Um, thanks for joining today. Today is actually the very first in our series of virtual gatherings here for the month of April. Um, we have a few others, and I'll talk about those afterwards, but I think you all saw those in the email. Um, so anyway, we just, we just wanted to let everybody know that even though we're not in the office, we're still working hard from home, from our computers remotely, and we want to keep the programming going and helping all our preservation advocates around the state. Um, so thanks for joining today. And I know some of you are members and we very much appreciate that. We are a member organization. So if you're not a member, we encourage you to join if you can. Every little bit helps, especially during these trying times. Um, so today's session is on tips for spring old house projects. Um, we have Steve Bedard here, Bedard, and it's not Liz, it's Steve Bedard, Bedard Preservation Restoration. Um, Steve Zada Gilmanton has been in the preservation restoration world for 35 plus years, working primarily on old houses and barns. A uh, big friend of the Preservation Alliance supporter, so we appreciate Steve being here. Steve was going to be give a couple sessions at our Old House of Barn Expo, and actually still will when we reschedule that, which we do not yet have a date, um, but hopefully soon. Um, I think it's looking like it'll probably be next March, not this fall, uh, but stay tuned. Okay, so I think before we start. I would love for, since there's only a few of you on anyway, if we could just go around in one minute introduction of who you are and your house you're living in and what you hope to get out of today's call. One minute though. So let's start with Christina. Hi, I'm Christina Fershbach. I'm uh, on the board of directors with Hayroll Her Heritage Inc. And we are rehabilitating the Wentworth Brown House which is um, a five structure um, starting from 1790s to 1805 to 1857. And it is um, a large, very large project. And then I also live in 1810 federal home here in Hero. Excellent. Do you have anything specific you're hoping to get out of today or are you just here to listen? Listen mostly and okay. um, areas of concern would be gutters and animals. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, let's go down to Monique. Thanks for joining, Monique. Oh, does Monique not hear us? I am. Can you hear me now? Okay. Welcome. Still learning about these video conferencing things. And yeah, I know. No problem. Oh, We're all learning, so it's okay. <laughs> We're just I doing a little one-minute intro on who you are and how old your house is and what you might hope to gain from today's session. Okay, so you can probably see behind me, um, I'm living in an 1809 home that I own. I'm hoping to have Steve come out and do some work for us soon. I definitely need some uh, basement structural support, um, some water issues going on here. Um, so I'm just hoping to learn anything that I can today. Okay, excellent. And Charlotte. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Oh. I don't think I need it because it sounds like Christina and Monique are both in houses very similar to mine. Yeah. 1810 Farmhouse. Um, the house that I'm in is a family property just south of Plymouth. Um, we just did um, an addition that provides winterized space. Um, because we were very, very anxious about trying to winterize the old space. And now we, if we can travel again ever, I'm sitting here in Chicago, the fact, false picture behind me. Oh. Um, if we can ever travel again, we can be staying there and slowly but surely doing what we can to save the old place. Um, sounds like I, Monique and I need to get together about um, 
where all that water is coming from um, or whether we really ought to be worried about all that water in the basement. But, um, I think everybody has that same issue. Okay. Then I must be lucky because I am only just barely wondering whether I should be worrying about my water as opposed to... Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're thinking along those lines. <laughs> That's good. Okay, who else? Um, Harrison? Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yep. Harrison, uh, uh, let me interrupt. Jennifer, did you know, I think that you can change, the host can change the ID. If you find the participant list, you can yep. read but we can all remember what his name is, is, whatever. I can change his name? Yeah. Rename. <laughs> yes. What would your name, what would you like your name to be? Oh, gee whiz, that's, uh, I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I've been lugging this name around for 71 odd years. So, so you, you wanted to say Harrison, right? Harrison, yes, please. Look at that. There it is. Look at that. I'm going to change my name to my real name. <laughs> Don't forget to let her to have her change it back. <laughs> Look at that. Thank you for teaching me that. Oh, Steve, do you want a name change? Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Okay, good. There we go. Beautiful. All fixed. Thank you. Okay, Harrison. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Enfield, New Hampshire, 1790s farmhouse. I wow. work at my wife working in the garden. Um, I think there's a common theme among us that the water was a problem. But I, after going to several lectures sponsored by you folks and a house tour or two, I think we've beaten back the flood. Excellent. Water that used to go through the basement. This was the house when we bought it. it. Was it was called the house on the hill with a spring running through it, and that's what it was. <laughs> so, um, and the reason I'm listening in is I always learn stuff. Um, so yeah, um, I'm here to see what else other people are saying and doing. Okay, great. And Mike. of being on these calls. I'm still trying to remember how to take myself off mute. Um, but, um, my name is Mike Rollo. My wife and I, am I off of mute? Because it's now saying yes. I'm on mute. Okay, well, my yeah. computer doesn't know what it's talking about. You're good. Um, my wife and I own a uh, 1790 Cape, not 1790 Cape, uh, in Hopkinton, um, which has, uh, it's structurally sound and everything's great in the 1790s part. It's where the uh, 1790 meets the 2003 addition that was put on um, where we have a, an ice dam every single year or we've only owned the house for two years we've got an ice dam for two years in a row um, so we don't know what we don't know um, so I'm I'm just gonna sit here and listen and, and hopefully uh, um, glean some information on what we should be looking for for the springtime projects okay and then who is this other person Who that called in? That was, I think that was Monique, and she's she's on she's on uh, view now. So. I have Zoom on, but I'm also on my cell phone oh, because okay. I'm getting delays on my laptop. Okay, so all right, great. Well, this is really I'm, interesting that everybody lives in very much of the same period house, which is really cool. So easy to a lot of common themes going on here. And when Steve and I were talking about what we should focus on, probably the number one issue was water. And it sounds like that is relevant to most of you. So Steve, do you wanna start with, um, well, let's start with wet basements and maybe what causes wet basements. And then I would love to hear how Harrison fixed his wet basement. Okay. <clears throat> Generally speaking, 90% of the time, wet basements are caused by um, improper drainage outside. It allows, you know, we always say if you protect your roof, 
But to keep water off your roof and away from your building, you want it. And that's true. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got a good roof on your building, the water comes off. But if it runs down to the foundation, to your foundation and can't get away from the foundation fast enough, it eventually um, go into the basement and create a, a water problem. So the majority of time, if you create a, a grate away from your house, that will solve most of the problems. Um, also, um, you want to look at that grade. It may look good, but if you've got if you've got a situation where you've got a lot of plants around or a shrubbery around, it's almost like a water dam, so so that can't, water can't leave that area and go downhill. It's stuck and goes right against the foundation. The other thing that I've seen, Beverly and I were laughing about this the other day. I've seen many times when people will install a sub pump in their basement and put the exit pipe right outside the window next to the foundation. Mm -hmm. So the water just keeps circling around and around and around. Um, that's certainly another, another problem that we come across once in a while. Um, how did you resolve your problem, Harrison? Very similar to what you said. Um, I remember going to someone's house that was sponsored by the New Hampshire Alliance. And first he had weatherproofed the basement. He had a sump pump and it was relatively dry. So we did the same thing and we were relatively dry. But every heavy rainstorm was our downfall. And it was only until two years ago when we had a local excavator guy and his brother come in and they knew what to do. They retrenched the French drain, they water, they, they knew how to, they, as one of them said, think like a drip. <laughs> and uh, they, knew, they knew how to control it. I have to say it probably, for many people, it might not have been the most graceful solution because we have a fairly noticeable manhole cover that, you know, a grill that you can look down in and see where it's being, the water is being caught and then led away from the house. But uh, other than that, that was the single most important thing is, as you said, getting the, the dirt around the house uh, able to shed water. So was your French drain installed <laughs> on the exterior? Correct. There's okay. a French drain on the exterior and then the basement has a perimeter drain. Am I, am I allowed to mention commercial names here? Sure, go ahead. Uh, there's an outfit in Barrie, I think, Vermont, called Northern Basement Systems. Um, and they seem to be pretty legit. They seem to know what they were doing. So that was the interior solution. But as I said, that only went so far. It was the outside work that we did just recently that kind of solved things. Which was the great, the witch, the uh, recent. That was to retrench and relay the French drain around yeah. places that weren't protected. <coughs> okay. I had done it originally and I had done it improperly. Now, how, even deep, if how deep did you go with your French drain? Four feet. Okay. Now, that's always the ideal thing to be able to do is do a French drain. But a lot of times it's, it can be costly. It can be a foundation issue. Um, but it's there again, if you, and think about the fact when the ground's frozen, that French drain really doesn't work that much. So that's why it's an, an imperative that you do that grade away from the, from the building. Um, but Harrison has the ultimate system that we'd all love to have. Um, but if you can't do that, you can at least change the grade, and make a huge difference. So I have a little bit of a unique system going on here. A uh, unique issue, I should say. Um, we have springs on the property. Mm -hmm. So we have the very high water table. We're up on a little bit of a hill with some ledge. Um, and we, um, right around this time of the year, we have a trench in the basement that goes right to the sump pump. We have a little bit of a trickle running down there right now. Sump pump is working great. We do have it going out a window, but it's going like 20, 30 feet away from the foundation. Um, but the springs just keep bubbling up, it seems. French drain? Mm, don't know if it's, if, it's a, if it's a spring problem. <clears throat> I don't know the French drain will actually uh, take care of it. It's certainly okay. a thought process. Um, what's the grade like where that water comes in from? Is it running towards the building or is it at all? 
Um, so the water table out here is really high. So you just get a, um, a little ways away from the house and you've got some standing water, some running water. There's a big pond out back. So there's a lot of feeding water um, okay. going into that area just from it's a wetlands around here. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely bubbling up from the floor. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I actually have one. We have in my house, which is a cape with an owl, with a carrot with a carrot shed attached to it. Uh, the middle, there's three separate cellars. The middle cellar has a drain in it, and in a high water table year, the, the water will actually come in the drain, up through the mm -hmm. drain. Yeah. So, um, there again, if you can even create a swale outside, a little bit of a swale, just get all that water. If you can't get a good pitch, at least create a swale by creating a pitch away, and then a swale, and then it can go back up towards whatever, just to try to drain that away from the house a little bit. Um, that might be a, a potential solution to your problem. Okay. We had a similar situation in our house. Um, like Harrison, we had a stream going through the basement when we moved here. And when I met the fire chief, he laughed at me. He said, oh, you bought that house, the one with the stream in the basement? Suburbs. <laughs> but we fixed it. And we fixed it, but we're sort of on the hillside, but on a, it levels out where our house is. So water comes sheeting down the hill, some above ground, some below ground. So we went out from the house probably 20 feet. And the joke in the house is there's more plumbing in the backyard than there is in the house. And we put a pipe that sort of intercepted all this water that was sheeting down the whole length of the back of the house and collected it and luckily we're on this hillside so then we could collect it and dump it around and further down below the house as well as a french drain around the house and a drain in the basement and with all those working together it's now dry but it was awesome. really really wet but the only reason we were able to do that is because we're on a little bit of an incline so we have gravity to help us where it sounds like monique doesn't have that mm -hmm. Is yeah. that true? Yep. Yeah. So that's a little bit more difficult situation there. So my leaks are pretty much identifiable at a bulkhead and at a corner of the house where snow is, I haven't got a picture of it, but I'm sure that it's a pile still over my head from where the snow comes off the roof. And that was that snow pile and melt finds its way. Um, one obvious solution is to get out there with a shovel and yeah. <laughs> get less of it melting. Um, but my, I, I don't have any reason to believe that my situation is any worse than it has been um, for literally decades. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any um, any disturbance at all, um, but I guess I'm curious about what I should be looking for so that I can see that it's more than I think it is, if it becomes more than I think it is, um, slowly but surely. How do I know when the dampness next to the wall is um, more than something that would will dry out by the time the snow stops melting? <laughs> or do I just, you know, keep track of it? What, what happens, uh, what conditions do you have when there's no snow but rains hard? Do you still have that? What kind um, of bulkhead? At the bulkhead, yes. Um, in the corner, it's not clear. Uh, probably not. Yeah. So my water issue melts into a how much do I worry about condensation? So for years, when my mother lived not nearby, she would come open the bulkhead on the muggy days in the summer. And we did not realize until she hadn't been doing that for, oh, maybe a whole decade, that we were actually getting a lot of mold in the basement. And um, we needed to take steps for the mold in the basement. That brings me to another question, which is, can I overly dehumidify my basement? Or, yes, you can. You can. <laughs> um, and how do I know when I've done that? 
But that's the reason why I am not sure whether I've got two places where water seeps in or only one, because one of them could be just where the condensation um, builds up on the inside rather than water coming, actually coming in from the outside. Okay, so you have a, bul you have a bulkhead. <clears throat> what kind of bulkhead is this? A wooden bulkhead, metal bulkhead? Um, okay, so it is actually um, stone steps. It's, mm -hmm. it's a gracious space. Um, stone steps with a newly built cover, but the walls of the steps need attention at this point. Um, okay. That is clearly no. something that needs attention. Um, but uh, in the meantime, um, I kind of need to worry about the wall that it comes into. Okay. Um, what's the grade around the bulkhead? Is there a pretty good grade around it so water can leave that area? Um, yes, not, probably not as much as if we were doing it all over again now we would provide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that corner of the house, I think, is actually our, uh, less of a problem than other stretches around the house in terms of what the area is. And what, what side of the house is that? North, south, east, west? It is the southeast corner of the house. Okay. The that's, a good, yeah, that's a good corner to have. Um, do you have an inner door in your basement, or is it just a stairs going up to the bulkhead opening itself from the basement? Um, there is a very inadequate um, door that is sort of where the wall would be, and, mm -hmm. then the, yeah. um, and then the rebuilt top of the bulkhead. So when I had that rebuilt, the workman, the craftsman that rebuilt the bulkhead um, door, only the door, not the walls or anything, were laughing at me for worrying about how much water I had in my basement at all. They were pretty much, oh, you ought to come see my house. So <laughs> you think you don't have a water problem here. <laughs> but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to be preemptive about my water problem. Yeah, no, that's good. So is the bulkhead door, the new one, wood? Yes. It's a wooden door. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. the old hinges, which are probably 1890s hinges on the, that were on the old door. I have to ask this, and I'm going to I'm going to assume that the craftsman has done a really good job. He's got it flashed properly, so when water comes off of the sidewall or sits there, it can't run in on top of the bulkhead into the basement at all. No, it's just it's it um, it the lack of integrity is at the corner where the um, stone wall that is the side of the bulkhead that I didn't try to have anybody do anything with yet um, meets the main foundation of the house, the stone wall that's the primary foundation. Okay, so that hasn't been repointed at all or anything like that yet at this point? No. Okay. no. Okay. I need to have somebody who knows what to look for to come tell me how big a project and um, my, my intermediate concern is there used to be a layer of plaster on all the stone walls that are the basement walls. And that is deteriorating, I'm afraid, quite quickly, um, given how, how many years there was too much humidity in the middle of the summer. Um, but it's a, I, I can't tell whether that layer of plaster on the stone walls was actually supposed to be doing anything with respect to the humidity or whether it was just because fancy people had plastered walls in their ba in their <laughs> their stone walls plastered in their basement. Is it actually plaster or is it a thick whitewash? It's more than a thick whitewash, but it I mean by calling it plaster, I, I wouldn't know what to call it. Okay. What do you think, Steve? It sounds like they were probably the inside walls were just parged. What oh, we call right. parging with, with parging? A, what's that what material would that be? It's a similar material as plaster. Yeah. Kind of a similar material. I mean, it comes off in hunks, not just chips. Right, it's right, right. Um, well, because if it's lime, lime doesn't like water. So that makes sense if it's lime plaster. Yeah, that could definitely be what the problem is. Um, 
What condition is the rest of the basement? What, what do you have for a basement floor? It's just dirt. Okay. I, as far as I know, it's the dirt that has always been there. Um, there are some walls that were probably built in the 1890s um, that separate a pantry and so that they could, um, and there's actually plaster with lathing in that pantry down there. Mm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so do you get a lot of, do you get a lot of moisture coming up from the basement floor itself because being dirt, is, it, is that wet or damp down there? Um, so only where, um, uh, so there's a narrow corridor down one side where there's a bigger moisture problem than on the other side. So the north side of the house has a bigger moisture problem than the south side. Um, one, the bulkhead isn't there, uh, and there's also a, um, a window um, above ground slightly on the south side of the house. That doesn't leak, but it does provide a little more ventilation. So there's mm -hmm. Uh -huh. There's a corridor um, on the north side where the floor, the wood floor on the wood floor is just literally loose boards on top of dirt. Um, right. And it never, never quite dries or in that portion of the basement. Okay. Well, there again, that's a problem that we see in most old houses that we don't store things in the basement. We don't use basements now like, like other people did in the old days. We, there's very few people who do a lot of canning anymore or store vegetables down there. But all the boxes and wood from doing that process can be laying on the ground absorbing that moisture. So if you don't yeah, have- well, that's not, I didn't tell you about all the barrels and the, yeah, right. <laughs> I got some really interesting barrels. That are down there. Barrels are wonderful, <laughs> barrels are great. Um, so the first thing you want to do is to go down your basement, see what you have down there that you don't really need to have down there. If you have cardboard boxes, I've seen people store books in the basement. I don't know what they were thinking, but <laughs> they get moldy so fast. Um, you want to clean your basement out of all those things that will absorb moisture and all the things that you don't need to have down there. It's going to allow for better air circulation. Then generally speaking, what you can do is you can actually take out four or five, six inches of the soil that's down there. Because usually the soil down there is mucky. It's got deteriorated wood in it. And then you can put down a, a, a six mil vapor barrier, if you'd like, with some sand on top of it. And then some crushed stone on top of that. And that'll change, really change the atmosphere down there in your basement. Never mind your bulkhead or anything else. So if my basement is mostly sand, and actually probably does drain itself. Would you um, still recommend my messing with it or? Um, uh, you, you're telling me it's sand, but when, when somebody puts boards down in the basement, it's because you're walking to try to keep your feet from getting wet and dirty in the basement. So there's gonna be some yep. snows down there that aren't as great as you think that they are. Yeah, okay, okay. So that's my gut reaction. So you can, I would take those out and then, like I said, uh, put a vapor barrier down. The vapor barrier helps. It's not mandatory. I've seen situations where the vapor barrier gets broken and then it creates more of a moisture issue than anything else. So a lot of times we don't even recommend the vapor barrier. We just recommend sand and then gravel and then, and some, or some stone, crushed stone on top of that. Yeah. Okay. Then or you can get a really heavy duty vapor barrier they exist that are really tough to penetrate it's but the, once again the key to the vapor barrier is it cannot be broken it has to go right. through it has to go all the way across around if you have a center chimney go around a center yep. chimney tightly so that the water can't get above it and then create a problem okay so right now what i'm doing and you know when I'm there all the time, it's not a problem. It's a little bit more of a problem when I'm not there at the right time. It's just running a couple of dehumidifiers like mad and, and it does seem to dry it out. I have two questions related to that. One I already asked, which is, how do I know if I've dehumidified too far? And to the extent that there was mold on the old beams, I, 
didn't tell anybody I was doing it, went down there and took a dilute bleach, bleach solution and just um, damped down the old um, beams. Don't tell me I shouldn't have done that, it's too late now, but um, what should I do if it happens again? If I start to get mold on the, on the wood itself? <clears throat> what you've done is certainly acceptable. But now that we're gonna change your basement floor so that you're not having moisture coming from there, we're gonna tighten up the bulkhead. You're not gonna have as much mold, potential mold issues as you think. If you can go typically somewhere between 50 and 60% humidity in the basement is fine. Um, I don't know what kind of humidifiers you're running right now, whether the old, they're all bucket style or direct, they directly plumb outside so you don't have to keep emptying the buckets. I have a I have a wonderful jerry rig system where I have uh, it uh, pumping into a garbage can and then sumps out of the garbage can out onto the lawn. Yeah, well, but <laughs> as long as you don't wind up with this garbage, as long as you don't wind up with this garbage can, open garbage can that's going to hold a bunch of water before it, you know, and sit there until it, the pump comes on the next time. You always yeah, trying no, to no, it drains itself pretty well. Yeah. Um, so. And but I do have a, a wall that, that is always going to see. That is, the north wall is always, if there's any humidity at, at all, it's always going to condense on the, on the north wall. I, so you that, think I, I think that's because your relative humidity is still high. I would encourage you to get a hygrometer. I have one in my basement. I love it and it'll tell you what your relative humidity is and you can monitor it and try to get it to that 50 to 60 degree range okay. in the summer. And then I think you'll see, as long as it's not water seeping through your wall, if it's really just condensation, you won't get nearly as much if you get your relative humidity down. Yeah, so there, now, I'm, now I'm starting to be jealous of the people who live on top of the hill. <laughs> We're, we're only about 50 yards from the river, and we have fog mm -hmm. almost every morning, no matter what the weather is in the summer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, old house basements are always a challenge, but I also think that um, a vapor barrier, something on your floor will make a huge difference. Harrison, you put a vapor barrier or something down? Um, we, <laughs> it's one of those things where we should have in retrospect, but uh, I, I think I go back to what Steve had said. We have a very um, heavy duty um, blanket of plastic. I've forgotten the name of the material, but it goes along the crawl space. That's something we haven't talked about, but mm. it covers all of the visible areas right up through to the almost to the sill and you know tucks the chimney in properly but when we get to the basement floor we we have still left it as concrete and it does weep um, someone earlier said that they live in a in a very um, high water table area and I, I keep forgetting that hydrology also works from the bottom up Right. as opposed to flowing from the north side in. So you're like, it's like a, in a somewhat like a boat. Um, and so we, we, we have a problem there and we should have addressed it, but in principle, I, I think I know what, <laughs> what to do better next time. So you poured the cement? No, floor? previous, previous the occupancy. Concrete? Oh, okay. Do you have, are there any drainage pipes under the floor? Do you know? No. Okay. The, the only thing that I mentioned is that we have a perimeter, it was newly installed, a perimeter drain that takes anything from the wall yeah. uh, and then takes it to a sealed sump pump and that is pumped out to daylight away from the house. Mm -hmm. So there's a little space between your floor and the wall for the water? Uh, it was all jackhammered in so it's, uh, you almost can't see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Christina, what about your basement? Um, there was two basement issues. My, in my 1810 house that I that I live in, um, the big rains a couple of years ago 
uh, seeped in to the basement and we had the choice. We thought we should do a French drain uh, because that's what some people had recommended. But one of the women over in Hero Corner who owns Bliss Tavern, she told me that they got rid of that problem in that area of their home by special gutters. And so we actually contacted the person that did the gutters because that's less expensive than the French drain or we were kind of looking at both and we have never had a problem since but the gutters are on the back of the house mm. and they also have special snow things um, so like if it was the front of the house we wouldn't have put put it there but where it's in the back of the house it really blends in you can't see it we haven't had a problem since on the um, on the Wentworth Brown house it's the north walls where I can see this winter from visiting the basement several times, um, I'm the local visitor to the house, <laughs> that I think that there's leakage around this, the, one of the windows there on that side. And then I think Beverly, you saw in the back in the corner one time. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. sure, this winter in particular, all along the, a little bit part of the north side, not all the north side, it almost seemed to be coming in the wall. And I could tell it was coming in from the windows because the ice, a little bit of ice was coming down from what looked like you could see where the windows was. But I was more concerned with what appeared to be just the wall even away from the window was uh, wet in all in that section. All the water has been turned off Yeah. outside and in there. And just in that one particular section, it does seem to be seeping from somewhere. And I don't know if that's because um, there's something wrong. In the, the foundations cracked a little bit in some part there in the, on, the, on the walls, or if it's just for um, that, that the soil needs to be pulled back away from the house. So. Yeah, be, I feel like the ground elevation is very close. There's not a lot of distance between the bottom of the clapboards and the ground, right? Isn't the grading sort of poor in that area? The grading's poor in a lot of areas around the home. Um, this is in the 1805 main section. That's the one that has the yeah. granite. Is it like a granite foundation and then the uh, roll granite type of walls? <laughs> Explain yeah. it. They are parched a little bit on the interior, and it's coming in way deep. Um, not like it seems to be soaking. It's the whole wall is soaked, almost as if it, the moisture is seeping in um, uniformly. Uh, yeah. against that wall versus dripping down from somewhere. Although I think part of the issue is water coming off the roof. Correct me, Steve, if I'm wrong, but I think it probably just saturates that ground right there because it doesn't get to flow away from the building and mm -hmm. then it ends up going through. Most the likely, <clears throat> most likely. I, I did see one uh, last year on a house towards the Plymouth area um, where the um, the L basement had a stream running through it. And you know, somebody had done a really nice job with a concrete floor in there and all that. And the owner, owner couldn't figure out what it was. Well, what had happened was there was a woodchuck who had created a hole next to the foundation. Oh, no. And of course, water was being transferred down that hole every time it rained and it was, it was creating the stream that ran through. So once they fixed that problem, it wasn't an issue going forward. So sometimes critters will make those holes. You know, we think a chipmunk's doing it, um, but a woodchuck will get in there and make a make a hole, and the water just comes off the roof. What what bothers me is about you've resolved your water problem in the basement by gutters on the back, which means that there still has to be some type of a slope issue out back there that you still should try to try to fix. Because if you think about you get a lot of snow in that area, it's going to melt off. It's still going to run in towards your basement, even though you have your gutters. Now that you've gone through the expense of putting gutters on, now, you, now you're now you really stuck with maintenance and making sure that those gutters are cleaned out all the time. I, I, I wish I could explain how much thousands and thousands of dollars that I've seen um, when people put gutters on and they, it's all good intention and they get, covered over or blocked up and then they create rocks to soffit and it runs it just creates a, a nightmare so now that you have gutters which is fine you really have to make sure those get cleaned up twice a year it's very fall it's really important so did you say christina that you had um covers over them so it keeps the leaves out 
Yes, for the ones we have here on the 1810 house, um, the ones that are lower, my husband cleans, and the ones that are up above get, um, there's, I should look out my window, I could tell. <laughs> he has them in such a way that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get affected. It's a very small part. On the Wentworth Brown house, I definitely, the whole house, or most of it, seems to have gutters around it. And now that we're in the rehabilitation part of it, it's, you know, you're right about that you would really have to be maintaining those like twice a year. They're old gutters and they're really, really up high. And that's a lot of work. I'd like to somehow, either, if it's at the point of rehabilitation, wondering if it's better to switch away from the gutters and deal with the moisture around that whole house in some other way besides the gutters. Yes, please. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Um, one of the projects we're working on now is down in Centennial Hall in Northampton. And they have a gutter system that was built in, in um, 1876, of course. And it hasn't been maintained very well. It's, you know, it's 25 feet in the air and people can't get to it. So this last time when the roof was, it has a slate roof on it, when the slate roof needed to be redone, um, we actually went over the gutters completely and allowed the water to go off the side of the building. It's fine. It hasn't been watered in the basement or anything like that. So if you get access to gutters, that's great. But if you don't, if they're too high, it's really difficult to maintain them. Well, that's what I was thinking for, for the Wentworth Brown house. It's just the, um, the height of the home, where mm -hmm. the gutters are, the, how, much, how much of it has gutters. <laughs> um, right. That it seems like then maybe work. there's a better, like you mentioned, look, look into it uh, as far as drains or. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that brings me to, if you have an old home with various structures on it, as far as the foundation, some granite, some on grade, um, some posts, is there a particular type of way that you es excavate to get the soil away? Is it just if you hire someone that is very good with historic preservation, should they automatically be knowing what to do or is it change um, how you're going to approach pulling away the soil from the home depending on what the foundation is? I think if you're going to get into a French drain situation like Harrison mentioned, you want to have someone who's knowledgeable about old house and foundations and different types of foundations. Because typically in an old house foundation, we go in the basement, it looks really nice on the inside, it's fairly flat, it's fairly go outside if you dig outside you'll find that there are bowls that stick way out the walls maybe actually batted where it actually um your foundation wall at the top may be six or eight inches wide at the bottom it might be two feet wide so it's really important when they're digging that they dig down very carefully otherwise they will disturb the wall and create more of a problem than they actually um, can deal with now, if, if, if by chance you are going to, if this was, and I'm just gonna use this as an example, if this was a project that was um, a potential L-chip project, and whatnot, and you were contemplating making those changes and doing some major excavation work around the building, you wanna make sure you would have to have an archeologist there to do some pre-testing to make sure that you're not gonna come across any uh, artifacts or, 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 or concern. Okay. Um, one area of the north side of our house had poor drainage and a lot of water infiltration in the back corner of the basement, and we didn't want to put a gutter on, so we actually dug down, I don't know how far, one, two feet, and put a rubber membrane down there that shed the water out into a dry well, like way out far from the house. Um, so anything that drips off the roof cannot get down along the side of the foundation, and that totally fixed the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it was very one localized area because there were there was a valley dumping a lot of water, so it was easy to deal with ourselves in a smallish area, but it worked really well. But once you get that dug out, if you could, if you dig down a, a foot or two, I don't know how much how far you went down, Beverly. But um, if you dig down a foot or two, while that's open, that's a good time to have the mason come in and repoint that foundation from the outside. Yep. Okay. Um, that's the key. If you're not going to stop. I mean, you're not going to stop any water from coming in if you just do the inside of your, your building. You don't have to go all right. the way down the bottom of the foundation, but the first couple of feet 
it's certainly appropriate. Right, it's best to try to prevent water from even getting through the wall. Deal with it on the outside first, if you can. Right, right. Yeah. Mike, did you have any basement water, wet basement questions? Uh, nope, my basement's fine. Oh, good. Okay, oh. well, do you have any other questions you wanna have addressed? We can change topics. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my issue is um, the old, meaning the new part of the house. Okay. Um, with ice dams. All oh, right. That's my issue. It's still water related, but um, we um, we have insulation in there. There seems to, I don't know if there's adequate uh, ventilation, but um, it just, it's, it's a perennial, it has become a perennial issue, so. Is this a valley, Mike, between? It is, it is, yeah. And what's the, is there a little attic up in there? Uh, there is, yeah, there's a little, uh, yeah. A little okay. Area. And um, I assume the roof isn't insulated, right? Uh, it is not, no. Okay, good. And so, yes, you could be having a, a ventilation problem where it's, you know, I mean, basically you want to have a cold roof. Right. At the time. Uh, Does everybody understand what causes an ice dam? Now, it's counterintuitive. If Steve would like to describe it, that would be great. Okay. Um, the first question I want to ask Mike, though, is, um, do you know, did you roof that or has that been roofed recently? Uh, the roof is about seven years old. Okay. Do you have water getting into your house? Uh, I have, uh, not normally, but I have had it happen twice now, yes. From there, okay. From there, yes. Okay. And typ typically, I, an ice dam occurs when you have um, basically temporary vari variation, where instead of the area under the roof being cold, similar to what is outside, there's a lot of heat that's coming up from lack of insulation from your heated space okay. or lack of ventilation on each end. Um, and what will happen is it creates, it's warm, so then as soon as that cold air hits it, it becomes ice. Um, typically what we recommend now, it used to be the recommendation back in the day when it first came out that you use ice and water shield. And I always, I'm gonna, this is really, really important now that our, our climate is getting warmer and warmer. You want to be using a high temperature ice and water shield underneath your shingles and not just one row up three feet. You want to be two rows, so you're up six okay. feet. Because right. I have seen on many occasions where the ice dam will build up past that three foot section. Okay. And get behind it. So if you go six feet and six feet in your valleys, even if you get an ice dam, you shouldn't have a problem leaking. But it sounds like you've got an insulation problem in that attic. If you go up in that attic during the middle of the winter on a cold day, is it cold up there or is it lukewarm, so to speak? Is it kind well, of? Well, it's, it's certainly not as cold as it is outside. <laughs> and that's probably my problem, right? So I think, yeah, yeah. I think that is part of your problem. Um, so <clears throat> you want to create this, and there's this bunch of, I don't know what you have for, do you have uh, windows on the gable end you can open up? I do not, no. Okay, what is your, is what kind of ventilation is there? I, I don't believe there is any at all on, on that section, that's the problem, so. The new, on, on the new section? On the new section, yeah. A ridge vent, maybe? Uh, I, there should be, but no, there are not. Yeah, and, and there again, even a ridge vent doesn't really provide a lot of uh, change. Is there a gable end wall there at all? Uh, so, there is, yes. Okay. What you can do, and we've done this, we've actually done this for, in buildings so that you don't even need to have air conditioning, which is which is really handy. Okay. In, in that you can put a power vent in on a create a, uh, an opening on the gable end for a power vent that has a automatic louvers that open up. They're not they're not expensive. They're between around two hundred dollars or one hundred and eighty five dollars, mm -hmm. and they are on a on a thermostat. You can also get them on a hydrostat, so that you can adjust the the. Um, um, the humidity up there also. But basically, if you just get them with a thermostat, you can set that to go off. And it works really well in the wintertime as well as, as, as the summertime when it's really hot. So let's say your attic gets to be 90 degrees. They'll automatically come on and blow air with the louvers being open until it gets back down to whatever setting you use. 
Okay. And then shut itself back off. You never have to touch it. You never have to go up there and do it physically. It does it by itself once you set those parameters. Okay. You can also get them with remotes. And those have worked really well. We, we've used them in lieu of um, air conditioning where you have them on the gable end of the house and you have um, a hatch to get into your attic, which you probably have. And what people do is we'll open that hatch in the late afternoon, mm -hmm. let that thermostat kick on upstairs, let the, let the uh, um, blower kick on and all that, and then open a window down the first floor and leave it open all night. And that just sucks that cold air up into the building. Okay. And the next morning you shut that hatch and you're, you're good again. Huh. And, and what is it called again? I'm sorry. It's called a, a whole house. Um, power vent. Power vent. Yeah. Okay. Power vent. okay. And it comes with, a, they come with a louver package, aluminum louver package. So you don't have to worry about rain getting in there or anything like that. Okay. So, can't get, it's, it's, it works out pretty well. So Steve, oh, in the well. winter where you obviously don't want to open your windows downstairs, do you also need events or something to let air come in? <clears throat> well, if you have an old house, which most of you have, we're talking about old houses, a ridge, vent, a ridge vent typically does not work because there's a ridge pole. You have ridge poles that run between your rafters. So there's no way roofers will put them in, but they really don't work because they can't get past right. the wood. But how about down at the eaves or something? <clears throat> the eaves are a little tricky. Well, we, if it's, new, if it's the eaves can be very tricky. Um, we just basically leave them alone in a new house or they're a new addition because you're going to have, you're going to have, typically you're going to have a ridge vent that runs continually along the ridge. Mike, is this in the old or the, this is the new, right? This is in the new, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if you have that situation, usually what we do is when we're building the, when we're building the trim detail and you've got your fascia board that comes down plumb with your sidewall, um, it's the outermost surface you see, then underneath that you have a soffit. That run, board that runs back to your building and back out to this trim piece, this fascia board. We take some Coravent, a strip of Coravent, about three quarters of an inch wide and run it continually around that whole piece behind the fascia board, up against the soffit and back to the building. So that gives you that airflow to get up into that new structure. Okay, yep. It keeps it cool. Yes, well, thanks, I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Beverly, could I ask a roofing question? Sure. In addition to what Mike, Mike, did you get all your questions answered before I weighed in? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Um, Steve and others, we have a standing seam roof, which we will probably have to do again after 35 years of service. And we may need to, and we, we want to put a solar array on our roof. Does anyone have firm opinions about whether standing seam is superior compared to asphalt when applied, when applied underneath a um, solar installation? Um. Well, I look at it from a logical standpoint. First of all, your standing seam roof has done really well. It's lasted 35 years if not, and probably will last longer if you mm -hmm. didn't want to put the solar array on. Right, right. Um, it is difficult, even though they advertise them, you'll see 50 year roofs, lifetime roofs, and all things like that. I've seen so many problems with those that your standing seam roof seems to be the right approach and and you did pick the right metal roof we we put a lot of standing seam roofs on or buildings we work with have them put on by other people and they're a great a great roof system for a metal roof um no matter what you do if you're going to put a solar array up there um the issue is going to be when you have to replace the roof, you're gonna to have to take that solar array back down. And I think that they figure on around $3,000 to do that. That number sounds about right, as I remember. 
So if you're gonna if if you're not planning to live past 110, you're gonna be okay to to put that standing seam on and not worry about it again. Yeah, that's funny because the uh, the salesperson for the company said this will be the the <laughs> the only roof you'll need for the rest of your life. And we thought, yeah, there's mathematic certainty to that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm giving you extra time. I'm going out to 110, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so Harrison, your standing seam roof right now is only 35 years old? Yes. Why does it need to be replaced? It has some leaks around septic pipes and the chimney, minor, but, but noticeable. But if we put a solar array on an old roof, I think we'll be asking for trouble 10 years from now. And as Steve mentioned, in order to put, long story short, we want to put a roof on that will really last when you put an expensive solar system on yeah. top of it. We want to do it now rather than think about it later. Okay. Because I mean, life expectancy for a standing seam is pretty long. What is it, Steve? 50, 60, 70? I think the manu uh, manufacturer only, rec only will guarantee it for 20 years, but typically they go a lot longer than that. And so I think 35 years, I mean, if I had a standing seam roof and went 35 years, I'd be happy with it. Yeah. Um, but I want to say that, that if Harrison was not, gonna, was not concerned about his solar array or in whatnot, sounds to me like his roof is in good condition. You just have issues around your vent pipes yeah. and, and probably flashing issue on your chimney. So that's easy enough to fix without having to replace the whole roof. But since you're going to, and you're still going to have to do those, you're still going to have to deal with your chimney issue too. Right. And, and like Mike, we have a uh, we have an ice dam in our valley that has to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing about standing seam versus asphalt, yeah, I believe, at least from what I've researched, is that your solar is actually going to attach to the standing seam and not penetrate the roof, whereas asphalt, you're going to be making holes in your asphalt. Right. So yeah, the, it's going to stand on top of the standing seam. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody have, we're actually already at six o'clock. I know Charlotte had a, she had emailed me a few questions that I have answers to, but does anybody else have other questions they want to talk about real quickly? Can I ask one more question? Sure. So Steve was talking about that animal holes and how water can chase down those into the basement. Uh, we have a, an old well very close to the house and we're wondering if rainwater and, and melt can be running down through that old well and into our basement. It's definitely, fe definitely feasible. We, um, we live up on a, on a hill. Um, they drain away really well, but there are six wells, dug wells on our property. Um, one is in, one is about 10 feet away from the foundation. The other one's about 30 feet. And they're, they're all over the place. Um, generally speaking, unless it's a high water table, I don't, the well probably won't hurt what's going on. Um, I've seen many houses where there's a well in the basement. My daughter's house in Maryland has a physical, an actual well in the basement. It's not utilized anymore. Um, yeah. Sometimes we see cisterns in the basement, of course, for collecting water, which creates a right. huge issue. Yeah. Um, so this one had been filled in with, we think, rocks first, and then they poured a bunch of cement down it at some point, I don't know, 20s, 30s maybe, because uh, they were worried about the kids falling down in there. So, um, right. you know, who knows what's under there? Right, and, and because they, I mean, how they're typically filled appropriately is you fill them with sand. You actually fill them with sand. Um, because right now what's happened is they've thrown rocks down there. I'm sure there are plenty of voids around there so that water is still migrating to the sidewalls of the old uh, well and creating, and then you have possibly sitting there and also running out into your foundation or whatnot. Right. So, okay. but it's okay. I mean, that's what you got. 
that's the one thing with little house is you, you inherit these situations and, and you have to have a good, uh, good viewpoint about these things to survive. Right. Thank you. Oh, anytime. Okay. And then Charlotte, I wanted to get, thanks for sending your questions. Um, Charlotte sent me five questions and I can just run through them real quickly. And I just also wanted to say, if you have to sign off, thank you so much for joining us today. I will send a follow up email with some resource information and a really short survey. If you have additional questions that we didn't answer today or you think of others, feel free to send them to me. Or Steve's doing another one of these talks on April 21st that you're more than welcome to join again if you'd like to. Um, but let's see, Charlotte's first question was, um, how can you determine the material that was used for sealing plaster and paint? And Charlotte, the, if you refer to preservation brief number 21, there's a good description of plaster and the three, three layers of plaster in older historic homes that might be able to help you. Okay. Uh, Steve, do you want to touch on anything there relating to plaster in this time period house? On repair or just in general? Uh, we, have, we have several ceilings that need um, repair and you can tell just by looking at them that they are not all of the same vintage. Uh, and so we may, we may need three different people because we may, you know, depending upon who can deal with which kind of materials. Um, right, right. Well, um, first we got to figure out gonna, what we've I'm got. I'm going to try not to get myself, I'm, try, I'm going to try not to get myself in trouble here. Um, but um, we have to be realistic about these things. And sometimes you get a ceiling that's really bad. The, a lot of the keys are broken from the backside of the plaster or around the lath. The lath's not attached very appropriately. Typically, from a house of age we're talking about, it's not as much of a problem as later houses or later additions because um, the lath tends to be thicker and the plaster thinner. And as we, for some reason, they decided around 1850 or 1840, hey, we're just going to make the lath really skinny and thin, and we're going to put thick, thick plaster on. And that's going to solve a lot of problems. Well, it doesn't. It makes it worse. There are situations where a plaster ceiling is so damaged, it has so many problems with it, and you can't keep paint on it because it, you know, some, a lot of times it has the paint, a, a calcimine paint was used at one point on it. Um, and when that was utilized, after that, people put other paints on and the paint would peel. I've seen, I've, I physically have put on paint, gone away and come back to us later and have it come off in sheets just sheets. And so, and so if you get a situation where you have a really hard time with, with a ceiling and you have, if you have moldings, that has to be a concern along the ceiling between the ceiling and the wall. But a lot of times what we wind up doing is we wind up putting on wire lath right directly over that ceiling and then replastering that ceiling. And it only takes up about three sixteenths or a quarter of an inch in space. So if you have no moldings along the ceiling, it won't, it doesn't affect it at all. But you wanna make sure you, if you do have moldings, you have a step enough so that a flat face on that, so mm -hmm. that um, you know, the plaster won't come down onto the curved parts of the molding. And that, we've done that a lot. And it's, it's, once you do that, you never have to worry about a crack ceiling or paint peeling off it again. Okay. So we have some places where the integrity of the plaster um, was damaged because of uh, leaking on a roof. We had a, 40 years ago, we had a disastrous um, thunderstorm in the middle of a re-roofing. Mm -hmm. um, we, it was never, it isn't bad enough to have done anything about those ceilings. Um, but as a cosmetic matter, people are starting to get fussier and um, wondering why nobody's ever fixed the ceiling. So we right, right. In the ceilings. That's that's a that's that's a fix that we use as a last resort. Obviously, we want to keep as much original plaster as possible. Um, we're doing um, we're involved with a project um, 
in New Market right now on a church in a church where they had a structural issue that caused a lot of uh, damage to the plaster. And in one area, there's so much damage to it, about a 12 foot by 20 foot tall area. There's so much damage to the plaster, it didn't make sense to try to just repair it. Because they, they had done that over the last 20 years, they kept repairing it, it keeps cracking and cracking and cracking. So this time we're putting wire lath up and just plastering it. Mm -hmm. And that seems to make a difference. It should make a big difference. We actually took down. We actually took down a house, the uh, Colonel Paul Wentworth house, when it had been moved in 1936 down to Dover, Mass, from Rollinsford, um, and we brought the building back to Rollinsford, and we took that house apart. That was all done with metal lath, and even though it was 1936 and this was 2012, there was not a crack in that entire place anywhere. And we actually had to cut the lath out in two foot sections. That's how well it, it stuck to it. But I, I was just amazed that there was no cracking. So hmm. that's that's the plaster fix that you want to look at if, if you've got a really badly um, failing uh, plaster system. And Sorry, Charlotte, but... in my um, email that I'm going to send to everybody after this, I will include some plaster resources, some information. Okay. And a link to that um, preservation brief. Thank you. With Thank additional you. information. Okay, and then another question Charlotte has was about was about uh, multi fluid chimneys. Um, let's see. You say you have two fireplaces on the first floor, two on the second. Um, they, how can you fix them? Where an insurance company will carry your policy. <laughs> <laughs> and do flu linings work or are they likely to cause many problems? Steve? Oh, this is a fun, this is a fun one. This is one of my favorite ones. Because people always want to use their fireplaces and I don't blame them. We, I mean, we like to use our fireplaces. So, um, same thing. Obviously, if you're having a, a chimney rebuilt all the way down to the smoke chambers, you want to go ahead and use a flu tile and do them that way. Um, if you're going to redo your chimney, if, if your chimney top is so bad that it has to be replaced and can't just be repaired, you can go ahead and, and put, run flue tile at, long, at least down to as far as you can go. Um, what we do is, in a situation that sounds like yours, where you can't really, may not be able to get in there, and what do you do when you get into a situation above your fireplace? Most chimney fires are located above your fireplace. Um, and around the timbers in the attic floor between those two areas. Um, when they, when we, a little bit about fireplaces, we don't use them like they used to be used. They're always running all the time. We tend to build these giant hot fires and then they, you know, sm things smolder. And so we get a lot of more, we get a lot more chimney fires than most people would in the olden days where these, these fireplaces were used every single day for heat during the winter time. So what we do is, because you can't, we don't want to tear everything down, we'll actually create these windows or spaces above your fireplace. If this plastered, it's easier. If it's paneling, it's a little more difficult to take out. We'll we actually take our section of that out. So the mason can actually reach up in there and, re and purge all of the clean out and then purge all of those bricks that are there. And you can create multiple spaces that way as you go up your chimney. And basically, that will meet that generally we have not had a problem when we when we've been doing this with the insurance companies we've explained to them how it works basically you're you're providing this thin coat of plaster parging that well it can be it depends how it can be a quarter of an inch thick it could be three eighths of an inch thick depending <clears throat> and that'll take care of the fire issue getting behind a brick and things like that so is that actually the mortar the same mortar that's used between it can the bricks, be. It can or is be it a little bit? Yeah, basically, it's a variation of the same mortar. Okay. The problem that the problem that comes into when you are, if you are going to do a flue liner, or if you're going to do a poured in chimney from up top, where they come in, they pour something in for you. Those chimneys are calculated. The sizes that are there when they were originally built are calculated based upon what the opening is down for your fireplace. And what happens is when you choke down that opening up top, 
it creates a situation where your smoke chamber can't exhaust the amount of smoke there is fast enough and you'll get down drafts and you'll have, you won't be happy with what, what goes on. So in, a, in very rare situations, we will recommend it. Um, but typically we recommend on some type of repair situation rather than doing a poured in liner. And it's usually, it typically is less expensive than doing poured in liners are not, are not inexpensive. Well, we, I think we had um, somebody who I don't know whether they knew what they were talking about or not suggest that our flues were going to be so intricate that trying to do anything remotely, whether it was pouring or anything else, was going to be virtually impossible because you can't, you could never predict exactly where the bends were going to be and how um, tight they were. But I, I don't know. Right, right. It's a, it's a it's a problem when you buy an old house. Um, fortunately, our center chimney had already been ripped out 42 years ago when we got here. So we put a center chimney back in, and we did it all with flue tile at that point. So it's it's fine. It's we never had a problem with it. We've never had to clean it. Um, they, they you know if you if you burn if you don't burn pine and you burn well seasoned wood. You generally speaking don't have any problem with a chimney whatsoever. Could I quote you for that for my insurance company? I mean, we we <laughs> we were just told we will not insure you if you don't close up that fireplace. Um, and since well, it depends. You know, it's one of those situations where it depends. I, I'd want to see your chimney too to make it determine. You know, because you see some chimneys that shouldn't be pe people should not be burning wood in there no matter what. Um, so it's it's always a but if you can expose those areas and show them what you've done to make the repairs, we haven't had one cancel the insurance policy once we did went through that procedure. And Charlotte, I found with a lot of old house owners and barn owners is that if you get a professional in there who really knows what they're talking about and does the repair properly, and then you talk to the insurance company, they usually back down if it's done well. I mean, I've had barn owners, same thing. The insurance company said, you have to tear the barn down or we're not covering you. We're not going to hold your policy. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And they back down once you, you know, well, stand up we, for what you have. We actually um, thought of ourselves as lucky that they were willing to underwrite when we really hadn't closed off the fireplaces. We had rearranged things so that they would be difficult to use, but they, they, they still exist. And um, if I get the wrong relatives in there, who knows whether they'll try to use them. Yeah, that's the problem. Um, um, are there dampers in your fireplaces? Each fireplace has a damper? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, definitely the two on the first floor do. I don't know whether it's been so long since anybody tried to use the flues that uh, have their um, that come to the fireplaces on the second floor I don't know whether they have a separate damper or not okay well obviously it, and, and if, if you have a fireplace and you're not using it um, if there's no damper in it you need to block it off so they don't have all your heat rushing up throughout through you your fire oh plate. no! We're, I I should have made it clear. <laughs> this is a totally unheated summer space. only. This is a summer only space. Yeah. So yeah, hence okay. the temptation to start a fire is can be overwhelming. It can be. It can be. Um, but even though even though you're not there all the time, having the capability. Of, I got a phone call one day from a woman in Farmington who was really at that. She was excited and upset at the same time because she had just seen a she had never seen a black squirrel before outside and wanted to know what if I knew anything about it. And, and come to find out the squirrel had been going up and down the chimney into her living room and was completely covered with soot. And so, you know, we, we had her basin come and put a damper in and there's been no problem since then. But yeah, uh, but now she has to paint her every chimney clean. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah. Yeah, you want to at least keep the critters out. If you do have a house that's that's heated in the winter time, you got um, masons like to they like to put in what's called top dampers now that are up on the top of your roof, right at the at, at they're actually in the chimney at the very top. 
and and I've never been a fan of those because I've always felt that you want to stop the heat before you get up into your chimney rather than way up the top because then you can get that condensation issue, yeah. um, which could be a problem. And then you see masonry being blown out because of that. Hmm. So. Okay. And then one last fun question, which um, Charlotte, thank you for asking this about ladybugs. Cause I did not, I learned something. I researched this today. Um, the, are the regular ladybugs we're all used to, how they differ from the Asian lady beetle. And I didn't realize, I always thought the ladybugs in my house were the nice beneficial ones. Well, they're not, they're the Asian lady beetles. Um, but I also found out that they, they're really not harmful to your house other than little yellow excretions that they leave dots all over the windows and stuff like that. But they are dangerous to dogs, I understand. Sometimes dogs will nibble at them. I think this happens mostly outside when there's a big infestation, but they get caught in the hard palate of their mouths. And I was reading a case study where the dog had to go to the vet and have it, these removed. Um, yeah. I don't know, I know it sounds disgusting and I don't know why dogs are attracted to them. But anyway, they're not really harmful to your house, but what it means is that you have a lot of cracks and openings and the best way to keep them out is to seal up and caulk around windows and doors. But it was fascinating to research. I thank you for that question. And, and they're just normal cracks. They don't, yeah. it's, it's not like they like wet, dark spots. Uh, no, they actually, they come in in the fall because they're looking for a warm place. They hang out in the cracks, usually in your in your walls during the winter, and then in the spring, like this time of year, they will um, go towards the light. That's why they're always in the window areas because they like the heat, the bright heat. Okay. Um, so they're actually on their way outside at this time of year. But if they're already in your house, you just vacuum them up. Get rid of your vacuum bag, obviously. Uh, but caulk around the outside as best you can, outside and inside of your window and that will help. But don't use insecticides or anything. Yeah. Because they actually don't even work that well on these guys. Hmm. Okay, we're well over our time and I thank you all for participating. Any last quick questions? If you do, you can send me emails if you think of any others. And thank you very much, Steve. Really appreciate your time. No problem, anytime. Again, okay. Steve's doing another one of these on April 21st, if you want to join again. Okay. And thank you for being our guinea pigs. The first session, I think it worked pretty well. No Great. problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Stay healthy. All right. Great. Thanks Take again. Care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.